Hey, what's up guys? Tugi here back again, and let's talk about some signings and trades and everything that's happened since the second day of the draft. I have a lot to catch up on, so I'm going to get right into this. We're going to go team by team, and while I'm not going to declare winners or losers, I will kind of mention how I think a team will do and whatever. We'll just talk about it. By the way, I fully expect that Matt Duchesne or Alex Galchenyuk will be traded within five minutes of me posting this video, just to make it outdated immediately. Anyway, the Anaheim Ducks, their major signing, I mean, you know, they got a bunch of depth guys. Their major signing was Ryan Miller. Of course, they ended up losing Jonathan Bernier. He went to Colorado. Two years at $2 million. That's fine. And honestly, that's a pretty damn good tandem right now of Gibson and Miller. So Anaheim set up pretty damn well. And of course, there was the rumors of Anaheim going after Ryan Miller or just Miller signing with the California team way before he ended up going to Vancouver or really even St. Louis. I remember the original Buffalo rumors were that he was going to be traded out to California, so I'm not surprised to see him there. I have no idea what my computer's loading, and that is fine. They also re-signed Cam Fowler. Holy hell, $6.5 million over eight years. Guess they're not trading him anymore, huh? I mean, we went from those, you know, those rumors, which were just the, the hottest of hot stove rumors with, is Cam Fowler going to be traded probably to Toronto or something like that? Instead, he has a pretty damn good year, and he gets paid for it. Now, as far as what Anaheim still has to do as far as RFAs go or anything like that, I can't tell you for sure, but you secure Cam Fowler, you somehow managed, I mean, you did lose Shea Theodore, but you managed to keep Votnin and Josh Manson. You survived that through the expansion draft. Anaheim is still in a good spot. They're still a good team. You secure the backup goaltending, which... Bernier really let you down in the playoffs, didn't he? Bernier really let you down. So we'll see if Ryan Miller can be more consistent. Although I don't think I talked about the Patrick Eves contract. Interesting. <laughs> he went from making not much to making quite a bit. But for the Anaheim Ducks, I'd say things are looking all right. I mean, they're going to be one of those picks every year where you just assume that they're going to be in contention. Will this finally be the year that they do it? They're the Capitals of the West, just without Alex Ovechkin. That was a terrible comparison. Anyway, the Arizona Coyotes, of course, most of their damage was done through trading. Although, speaking of a, a certain trade, they did trade for Chad Johnson from Calgary and then failed to sign him as he signed in Buffalo. So I'm going to be intrigued to see what happens in Arizona because now, instead of a tandem of Ranta and Johnson... Ranta's the guy. I mean, you'll still probably have Louis Domingue as the backup unless you sign somebody else. But yeah, Ranta is the guy. I mean, you're moving on from the Shane Doan era. As far as their free agent signings, like Clendenning is a decent depth guy. Cousins is a decent fourth line guy. Why they signed Zach Ronaldo, I have no idea. They are going to be such a fun and interesting team to watch one way or another. And I can't wait to see what happens. Do I think they... Yeah, I mean, do we see Max Domi and Duclair perform at a higher level that you kind of expect them to? We'll see. All I know is that they are going to be a very fun team to watch, but as far as their signings here, nothing too impressive, really. The Boston Bruins, speaking of nothing too impressive, they re-signed Nolachari, which is fine. Two years on a pretty damn good cap hit, someone who will battle it out for bottom six time. They signed Kenny Agostino, the AHL's leading scorer last year. The assumption, I believe it is a one-way contract, so the assumption is that he'll be making the Bruins next year, which we'll see if that happens. It's kind of nerve-wracking. I mean, we've seen this before. I mean, Seth Griffith hasn't led the AHL in points as far as I know, but much like players in the KHL, which I'll talk about later, Players in the AHL can kind of struggle to, you know, translate that offense to the higher level. So we'll see what happens with him, but it is a very low-risk signing. Same with Jordan Schwartz. He's just more of a depth signing. Paul Postma is the biggest name on this list. He's not a bad defenseman, but he just cannot stay healthy. But again, it's such a low-risk contract. And aside from when's the Pasternak deal going to be done, the question is defense. And who's going to be that sixth defenseman? Morrow's gone to Montreal. You let go of John Michael Lyles. Who is going to be on that defense? Who is someone going to be able to make the jump? Are they going to make a trade? What if they trade Carlo and acquire Matt Duchesne, which is a rumor? I think the Bruins are going to be an interesting team to watch. And obviously for me personally, I'm excited 
to see how it pans out. And by the way, did I miss any of the deals? No, I did not. Just wanted to double check. Just because I noticed like, oh yeah, shit, I should have gone back even further. The only thing I didn't talk about was the Corbinian Holzer deal. But yeah, with the Bruins, no impact signings. It'll just be interesting to see who makes this team come this October. The Buffalo Sabres. Now, this is interesting. Of course, they did acquire Chad Johnson. He goes back to the Sabres, and that is a really good contract. You get Benoit Pouliot on a sweetheart of a deal. He's, I mean, was he overpaid in Edmonton? Yeah, probably. And I think we all knew he was technically overpaid when he first signed that deal. But Benoit Pouliot, for $1.15 million next season, that's a steal. That is one of the best contracts that has been signed so far. That is a great pickup for Buffalo. They also get Josephson, the former devil. Get him for dirt cheap. He could be a contributor on the fourth line. So no like gigantic signings for the Sabres. But you do add Chad Johnson, um, who you would assume is the backup. What's that goalie situation going to be? Is Allmark going to be you know back down in Rochester? this year, or do they want him to be the backup to Leonard? How's Robin Leonard going to do <laughs> this season? But at the very least, Taylor Fadoon, Matt Tennyson, or Tennyson, are decent, you know, defensive options for them. I mean, the Sabres are going to be interesting. I mean, is Evander Kane going to be traded? Is GM Jack Eichel <laughs> going to force another teammate to, you know, beat you? Who the hell knows, man? But the Sabres, again, another interesting team to watch. I can't wait to see what happens. Are they going to be a playoff team? They could be. You could argue that they have the tools to do so, especially after a trade that we will talk about a bit later because I will talk about the trades that were made as well. But yeah, an interesting team. But at the very least, Pouliot is on a just an amazing, amazing contract. The Calgary Flames. Not really, I mean, okay. Signing Spencer Fu, who went to Union College, I do believe. That's, that's a decent deal. Resigning Christopher Stieg for under $2 million, that's another good depth deal. The Michael Stone deal, I mean, they're stacked defensively, but you would assume at some point someone has to go. Now, yes, they did just shed the Weidman contract. With the Flames, we all know it. I mean, skating-wise, it's just they're contenders. It just comes down to the goaltending. Your goaltending is Mike Smith and Eddie Locke. Pfft, man, that's a that's a hell of a that's a hell of a pair to gamble on. But again, another reason as to why the Flames are going to be so interesting to watch this season. Carolina. Now, I've talked about this a lot lately. The Eastern Conference, I mean, just the NHL in general, there are so few teams that you can say with some certainty are going to be bad. You assume Colorado, more than likely Vegas, Detroit. But you look at teams like Carolina, New Jersey, Philly, all teams that missed the playoffs last year that could very well make the playoffs in this upcoming season. I mean, particularly with Carolina, you did have a lot of depth signings. Carrick, although Ryan isn't necessarily a depth signing, he had a pretty decent year last year. Quite a few depth signings. George is more of a depth, uh, depth signing. But then you get Justin Williams. I thought they could make the playoffs without Justin Williams, and yes, the goaltending might be a bit of a question with Darling and Ward and who's actually going to start, but the addition of Justin Williams as he goes back to Carolina, that is a solid pickup, although I have to admit, I am a bit surprised Williams didn't go to a contender, but I do suppose he did find success in LA. So yeah, for the Carolina Hurricanes, thumbs up, man. That is a pretty damn good deal to get Justin Williams on. And if you're a Canes fan, there is reason to be excited. Uh, also reason to be concerned, because who the hell knows, Carolina could move to QC next year. You never really know. <laughs> but yeah, Justin Williams, regardless, is a pretty damn good signing. Chicago, of course, are interesting because of the trades that were made more than anything. Of course, signing Anton Forsberg as a result. The big move, though, re-signing Patrick Sharp. And I'll be talking about this all video Players who should have or should sign dirt cheap contracts. And Patrick Sharp is, I mean, he did exactly what he should do. Dirt cheap contract for one year. You go back to Chicago, you have a chance to win the cup. You talk about guys like Jerome McGinley, who are still free agents. Don't look to get any money. Sign dirt cheap. Help the team out that way because then maybe they can bring in somebody else. 
I mean, fuck it, I'll talk about it now. Joe Thornton signing for 8 mil. I love Joe Thornton. I hope he gets a cup, but is he going to do it in San Jose? Maybe not. And I don't know if that case is necessarily helped by him signing for $8 million. <laughs> An $8 million cap hit. Why? You've already made your money, and I get it. My perspective is completely different, and if I'm in the same situation and you have someone offering me a million dollars to potentially win the cup, or someone's offering me eight million dollars and I don't have to move my family or be away from my family, I, I understand the balance of it. But even if you were going to stay in San Jose, man, take half of that. What are you doing? Help the Sharks out by not taking that much money. I hope to see Jerome McGinley go back to Calgary, by the way, for dirt cheap, pretty much what Patrick Sharp signed for. But anyway, with the Patrick Sharp signing, it's it's great for Chicago, and they're going to be extremely interesting to watch again. Easy to forget that they won the division title last year because of how the playoffs went for them. But with the Saad and Panarin deal, bringing back Patrick Sharp, we'll see what happens. They're bringing the band back together for the most part. Who knows what will happen. It's it's Chicago, man. If they win the cup, is anybody going to be surprised? Probably not. The Colorado Avalanche. Now, I do want to mention, because I did just uh, happen to remember this, and I'm going to miss some deals, but if there's anything that I miss here in this video that you want me to talk about specifically, let me know down in the comments below. But Mikhail Grigorenko signed with CS, uh, CSKA Moscow. He went back to the KHL. So that's a pretty big loss, and you look at what they've done free agent-wise, yeah, <laughs> you, cert you need to hope that guys like Landis Gog and McKinnon, Varlamov finds his game, is Matt Duchesne going to be there? Because otherwise, it's a bit rough. Now, you did re-sign Sven Andrigetto to a really good deal, which, my God, Montreal, what were you thinking? I mean, maybe Andrigetto just looked really good because he was in a different role in Colorado, but Andrigetto for Martinson. What a terrible deal. Aside from that, you have depth signings. Guys like you know Andrew Agazino and David Worsofsky. You bring in Jonathan Bernier. I mean, you lost Calvin Pickard to the expansion draft, but you brought in Jonathan Bernier. Varlamov and Bernier. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with that. You better hope Varlamov refines his, you know, finds his form once again. And that's kind of why, you know, you would assume Colorado will have a really good chance at a high draft pick in next year's stacked draft class. You have the Columbus Blue Jackets. Only four signings. None of them are major. They did trade a decent project, uh, prospect, or project really, in Dante Salatoro for Jordan Schrader. Who the hell knows why? You bring in Andre Benoit. He's back in the league, but nothing major. You do get Cameron Gounts, who a lot of people thought Vegas should have taken from the Vancouver Canucks. So that's a good signing. But nothing major from Columbus. Did there need to be a major signing? You did just pick up our Tammy Panarin after all. So not too much to say about Colorado. But then we get to the Dallas Stars. Now, do I think that their result last season was an accurate representation of their team as a whole? No, I think most people will admit that they were better than what the end result was last season, and a lot of that had to do with goaltending. Now you factor in Ben Bishop's between the pipes, and while he's no guarantee, you would assume it's going to work out. You bought out Niemi, he went to Pittsburgh. You could say, you could say that they might need one more defensive, you know, piece to really help put that puzzle together. But for the most part, man, the Stars are going to be a really fun team to watch, and they have improved over this. Uh, post, well, not necessarily the postseason, over the free agency. I'm trying to fight off these burps, man. It's not happening. Jesus, body, cooperate. I got a video to make. But they re-signed Essa Lindell for dirt, uh, well, for $2.2 million. I was going to say for dirt cheap. That was Bystrom's deal. But still, signing Lindell for that much money, that's fine. McNeil's a depth, you know, a depth signing. Uh, they did just trade for him from the Blackhawks. Maybe he'll make the team. Who knows? Everyone was saying he needed a change of scenery. Brian Flynn, good, cheap signing. Patrick Nemeth, good, cheap signing. Martin Hansel, not exactly cheap, but a good signing, and their center depth is looking really good. I mean, you basically just replaced Cody Eakin, who you lost for free to Vegas, with Martin Hansel. Most people would take that upgrade. Tyler Pitlick, what can he do? Can he stay healthy is the big question. If he can, you would assume 
he would make their lineup. And then the big name that I haven't talked about yet, Alex Radulov. And look, there's a reason why I'm doing this video in this style. Because even with the big signings like this, there's not much to really say. It's a great signing for Dallas. It's a preferable situation for Radulov, who wanted, I believe, six years from Montreal. He gets five years from Dallas. He gets that stability. I can't wait to see. Who's he going to who's he, who's he gonna be on the line with? Like, is he going to play with Sagan and Ben? Probably not, but then does that mean they're going to split up Sagan and Ben? Like, I cannot wait to see what the Dallas Stars look like this season. And they are going to be one of the more interesting teams to watch. Again, though, the question is, do they need that extra bit of help defensively? We'll find out. I mean, there there is a name down here that kind of sticks out. Gavin Bayreuther, who they signed out of the NCAA. Does he magically step up and solve that problem for Dallas? Who the hell knows? But so far, a great offseason for the Stars. And you could argue they have potentially won the uh, free agent frenzy so far. Detroit. One of the teams that you'd kind of expect to miss out, really. I mean, if we're being honest. You know, you have depth signings. Street, Lashoff, McElrath. You brought in Luke Witkowski from Tampa, who got some playing time last year. They did sign Trevor Daly. Of course, the Bruins were rumored to end up getting him. It's a decent contract. And you managed to hold on to Xavier Wallet. How Detroit didn't lose him or Mrazek in that expansion draft, I have no idea. Not saying Thomas Nosek is terrible, but still kind of odd. But for Detroit, not a whole hell of a lot you could do, really, cap-wise, contract situation-wise. It's not looking too great. I don't expect Detroit. Hot take. I don't expect Detroit to be back in the postseason. It could be a rough year in Hockey Town, which is a shame. You know, when you're opening a new building, you don't exactly want to be, uh, you know, on the downward slide. But who knows? Maybe they'll find a way to turn it around. Maybe Howard will be a decent goalie. <laughs> it's the first person to ever say that. Moving on to Edmonton. Now, they didn't have to do a whole hell of a lot. You do have the Chris Russell deal, which that's a classic Peter Chiarelli contract. It really is. Four by four. Uh, better you than me, Edmonton fans. Good luck with that. It might work out for you. I've been quoted many times on stream saying if it was an Edmonton Toronto Cup final, I wouldn't be surprised. Russell could contribute, but that's a risky deal. Zach Cassie in three years at just under two mil. He had a good year, but yeah, that's that's risky. <laughs> that's risky for sure. And then from there on out, it's a lot of depth and a lot of guys who could contribute. Griba, Callahan, Furlan, who I'd, I'd expect to be down in Bakersfield all year, Ty Reddy as well. So, for Edmonton, the key thing for them, of course, sign Leon Dreisaitl. Hurry the hell up, too. <laughs> and if I'm Calgary, I know Peter Trelli said he'd match any offer sheet. If I'm anybody, especially within the Pacific Division, why don't you just offer sheet Dreisaitl and just essentially price Edmonton out of it or, or offer Dreisaitl so much money, Edmonton accepts, and then that screws them over down the line. I don't understand why teams don't use offer sheets. Although there is, you know, kind of the talk that GMs find it to be a little bit cheap and that it could, you know, ruin your working relationship with the team. But who gives a shit if you ended up screwing them over? <laughs> if you ended up screwing them over, why would you want to do business with them anyway? Odds are they're going to suck because that, you know, they had to keep Leon Dreisaitl for a ridiculous contract. The NHL is fucking weird. But for the Oilers, things are still looking pretty good. The Florida Panthers, one of the more interesting teams, I would say. Alex Petrovic, not a bad signing. Redeem Verbata, not a bad signing. Then you get to one of the big names. I think most people expected him to go to Vegas, reunite with Chipashov, maybe have Radulov go there as well, and basically recreate Team Russia. That didn't happen. Dadnoff goes to Florida, or Dadonov, as you, uh, the, the proper pronunciation, but who gives a shit? It's a risky move. You know, he's been in the NHL before. It was kind of, nah. Obviously, in the KHL, he was tearing it up. But there's a big difference. We've seen a lot of people come over from the KHL that have done well. We've seen a lot of people come over that didn't do very well. And there's just, there's a huge difference. I mean, you look at someone like Danny Taylor, a goalie who just signed with Ottawa. One of the better goalies in the KHL. He gets a dirt cheap contract. So, it's just a different world. We'll see what happens 
It's a risky move to sign Dadnoff to that much. I suppose you did have the cap space without Riley Smith there, and you bought out UC Okanen. Although, why the hell did you buy out UC Okanen? I still don't understand that move. But again, the Panthers are going to be an interesting team to watch. And I suppose the biggest concern is can their big time players stay healthy? We will find out. But yeah, the loss of Riley Smith in March or so. Maybe Dad Knopf will be able to make up for both of it, although I don't believe he's a much of a penalty killer like Riley Smith. The LA Kings haven't really done much, but it's still looking okay. You get Darcy Kemper as a backup, which is fine. Christian Folan, a decent defensive signing, a bit of depth. Cal Peterson, played for Notre Dame, I do believe, out of the NCAA. Then Mike Camilleri. This is the type of contract I was talking about. One year, one million, dirt cheap. He goes back to the Kings. That is a pretty damn good signing. And you were able to get Stepan Fakovsky away from the Flames organization, which could work out pretty well for them. But yeah, for the LA Kings, you get Mike Camilleri on dirt cheap. Job well done. That's, I mean, that's a good spot. And Kemper, while he wasn't the greatest in Minnesota, I mean, there's still hope that he can turn it around. And obviously, for LA's sake, you hope to not see much of him. You hope that Jonathan Quick can stay healthy. The Minnesota Wild. Speaking of the Minnesota Wild, they have made quite a few signings. Resigning Gustavo Lobson and Patrick Canone or Canoni. And from there, Cal O'Reilly, depth signing, Ferraro, depth signing. They brought Svedberg back from the KHL. He did really well two years ago, but last year he struggled a bit. So who the hell knows? Really? <laughs> who the hell knows? Kyle Quincy, you got him for relatively cheap. You were able to get Ryan Murphy, who the Flames just let go of after the Eddie Lack trade. So that's kind of weird. Could be a decent little signing. But yeah, nothing major from the Minnesota Wild. Not too much to say. Montreal, I mean, it's a circus. It's just a circus. I can't wait to see what this team looks like. Despite them being the hated rival of the Bruins, I am so intrigued by what's going to happen with Montreal this year. Now, of course, you know, for minor deals, you re-sign De La Rose, you sign Frey's and Holland, Joe Morrow, Matt Teormina. Those are all really good signings and players that could have an impact at the NHL level. But then you have the three guys at the top here. I will say first about Les Hemsky, not exactly the greatest replacement for Radulov, but it's a decent, low-risk signing, and if he can stay healthy, he should be able to contribute pretty well. Carl Alsner, same thing, not a bad signing, you know, just under 5 mil, it might be a little bit concerning, but we'll see how that, you know, pays out, and I mean, you did just get rid of Beaulieu, so I suppose you would have been paying people money, and of course you haven't re-signed Andre Markov, so... Would you rather have Markov for $6 million or Alsner for $4.625? I'd rather have Alsner more than likely. And then you have Carey Price, the big signing, the big controversy. Is he worth $10.5 million over the next eight seasons? And really the way to look at it is, is it worth it for Montreal? Not, oh, is it worth it in general? You have to look at the team itself. And for Montreal, I would say it's absolutely worth it. We've seen what the Habs look like without Carey Price. And yes, while the team has changed pretty drastically since the last time he missed an extended amount of time, he is the best goaltender in the world. As opposed to say, you know, when, when he's your star, when he is your franchise player, yeah, you sign him to that much money. If this was Edmonton and you already have Connor McDavid, maybe, maybe not sign him for that much. But if I'm a Habs fan, I'm ecstatic. You managed to hold on. To Carey Price, you avoided having the situation of it being a story and a controversy for the entire season. If he didn't sign, they got it out of the way early. I'd be happy. I would. I mean, he signed until he's 37 years old. Actually, yeah. No, nope, wait. He signed until he's uh, 39, isn't he? I'm not sure. He has one year left on this deal, and then a new contract kicks in. But regardless, it's a good signing. Be happy, Habs fans. The Nashville Predators. Honestly, I mean, they were good. Yeah, I mean, they were good. No shit. I mean, <laughs> my, my point was they were good before making these signings. You add Scott Hartnell, another one of those sweetheart deals. You add Nick Bonino. Yes, you lost James Neal in the expansion draft, but we saw that progression from Arvidsson and Kevin Fiala last season. 
the Preds are going to be another, you know, they're going to be a dangerous team. They're going to be one of many dangerous teams in the NHL. But I'm excited to see what they can do this year. And for their sake, you know, you obviously hope that they have a better regular season, at least a more consistent regular season. But it almost worked out for them in not. So who the hell knows? But yeah, Benino, Hartnell, things are looking pretty damn good for the Predators still. The New Jersey Devils, I've talked about them. They're they're a potential playoff team. There's no doubt about it. You know, you have Taylor Hall, you're able to get Nico Hischier, you still have Corey Schneider. They are in a great spot. And as far as signings go, Brian Boyle is without a doubt the biggest name. Shocked he didn't go back to Tampa. Signs for two years in New Jersey. That is a great addition. Will the Devils make the playoffs? I mean, you could easily say no. You could also easily say yes. I really don't feel like they're that bad. There are some questions on defense, of course. But, you know, you win the draft lottery and everything. I tried to fight off that burp again. It didn't really work. I'm sorry for that. But the point being, again, I'm not just going to drag this out for the sake of dragging it out. The Devils so far haven't done much. Boyle's a good signing, but they could be an improved team next year. The New York Islanders, of course, their major damage, their major move was acquiring Jordan Eberle. Surprising, though, that they haven't done anything else aside from signing Seth Helgeson from the Devils. Now, of course, the big question is John Tavares. Now, as I mentioned with the Habs, who no longer have the worry of, oh my God, is Carey Price going to stay? The Islanders do still have the worry of, oh my God, is Tavares going to stay? You get Eberle, that should help out, but there are still quite a few questions in Brooklyn. We'll see what happens, man. But could you imagine John Tavares, if he hits the open market, that would be ridiculous. And that would set the Islanders franchise back by about 15 years. So Islanders fans, fingers crossed that doesn't happen. But yeah, Seth Helgeson, the only signing. The New York Rangers, they re-signed Brendan Smith to a pretty damn ridiculous contract. I don't know how I'd feel about that one, really. Not saying he's a terrible defenseman per se, but yikes. I mean, you get rid, you, you buy out Dan Girardi, and now you have over $11 million, or about just about $11 million, even really, in uh, between Kevin Shattenkirk and Brendan Smith. That is a bit concerning. The Shattenkirk signing, it's a good signing. You know, maybe his stock was hurt a little bit last postseason. But I'm not surprised. It was the rumor for the entire year. I would have been shocked if he went anywhere else, to be honest. And then they signed Andre Pavlik to replace Antti Ranta. Good luck. You know, maybe he'll do better as the backup with less pressure. Um, who knows? I mean, that, that's the thing about Pavlik. When he's on his game, he's, he's really good. <laughs> but when he's not on his game, which is a lot of the time, yikes. It's a one-year deal, though. The Rangers, and I've, I've mentioned this before as well, they're one of those teams that as long as you have Henrik Lundqvist, you have to go for it. Your cup window is open. You have no choice. You can retool a bit, but rebuild is not an option without trading Henrik Lundqvist. As long as you have him, you have to go for it. Signing, you know, signing Kevin Shattenkirk is a good indication of that, but we will see what happens for the Blue Shirts next season. For Hank's sake, I hope he gets a cup, but it's not looking too great. <laughs> it's not looking too great. I mean, if you think about the Rangers, realistically, their best chance was a few years ago. But you never know. Anything could happen, man. The parity in the league, basically every team's chance to win, is really high as opposed to, say, the NBA, where it's going to be one of two teams, isn't it? Maybe a third team. Maybe not the Thunder have made a deal. But you got the Warriors, you got the Cavs, you got the Thunder. That's exciting, right? But you got the NHL, like I said, a handful of teams, you're like, you know, oh, they're definitely not making the playoffs. But everybody else, all freaking 26 other teams, you could easily see it. So I can't wait for next season. And the Rangers should be another interesting team to watch. The Ottawa Senators. You re sign Mike Condon, good deal. And man, he earned that money. He bounced around for a bit, but he earned that money. Aside from that, you sign Nate Thompson, which is... A bit risky. Can he stay healthy? That's a pretty damn good question, but he certainly fits Guy Boucher's style of just shut it down defense. And yes, I know, offensively, they were scoring goals and everything. They were one goal away from the Stanley Cup Final. I know this, but he's a he's more of a defensive player. I'm just saying he fits that role 
very well, especially if someone like Chris Kelly magically decides to retire in the offseason, which who knows, could happen. And like I mentioned before, Danny Taylor, who really good KHL goalie, looks like he'll be down in, I think they moved to Belleville? I think they moved to Belleville. They're not the Binghamton Senators anymore. But he'll be their AHL starter, and he should be a pretty damn good one. Kind of like Jeff Glass when he was hanging around with Toronto, and I think he is still with the Blackhawks now. The Philadelphia Flyers. I mean, the draft was the big moment for them. You know, the Braden Shen trade, getting Nolan Patrick, although with Nolan now having another surgery and going to be missing rookie camp. Looks like, you know, the Devils made the right decision, which is understandable. But if Nolan Patrick can be healthy, things are still looking pretty damn good. They were able to re-sign Jordan Wheel, which is you know, really one of the key moves, like the only key move. I mean, they are giving Brian Elliott a chance. Steve Mason is gone. It's looking like the tandem is going to be Elliott and Neuverth, which mm, <laughs> is just as, just as inconsistent and just as big of a question mark as it was when they had Steve Mason. But if Brian Elliott can play like you know, the best version of himself. If he can be that best version of Brian Elliott, Philly's going to make the playoffs. They weren't that far off. You have Nolan Patrick just fall into your lap. It's still looking pretty damn good for Philly. And I do want to mention, too, I mean, they have a couple of guys that could make the roster as well. Uh, Mark Friedman, I believe his name is, that they just signed out of the NCAA. He could be pushing for a spot. I'm pretty sure they signed somebody else, but his name is escaping me at the moment. Point is, the Flyers are looking pretty damn good. You have the Pittsburgh Penguins. You sign Antti Niemi for cheap as the backup to Matt Murray. That's fine. That's, you know, it's not the worst decision in the world. You get a couple of depth guys in there. While you brought back Tom Sestito, who the hell knows? Matt Hunwick is a really good signing. I mean, he was pretty damn good in Montreal. You re-signed Justin Schultz, which is huge. Chris Summers, I mean, it's going to be an AHL. He's going to be an AHL guy. But he's not that bad of a player. He's not that bad of a guy. Just like Zach Trotman. So, for Pittsburgh, it's more of the same. Could they get the three-peat? Probably. <laughs> like, really, they probably could. Yeah, you lost Nick Benino, but things are still looking okay for the current champions. So, no reason to really do anything major in this postseason or in this offseason. I keep saying postseason. I don't know why. The San Jose Sharks. You re-signed Vlasic. That's a good, a good decision, but... Yeah, eight mil or seven million bucks over eight years. That's risky. He's a great defenseman, one of perhaps the most underrated defensemen in the you know in the league. But that's a hell of a commitment. You re-sign Martin Jones. That's a great contract. And man, I remember still a lot of people said, "Oh, the Bruins got Martin Jones. They should have kept him." You might not have been wrong. <laughs> that's a pretty damn good deal. They get Bebo who could very well be the backup next year. And then there's that Joe Thornton contract. Again, if I'm... Uh, it, it's, it's so easy to say when it, it's not actually you in the situation. But if I'm Joe Thornton, why? Why take $8 million? Why? Why bother? Just sign for cheap. Try like hell to have the Sharks bring in somebody else. Try like hell to win a cup. I don't understand it. It is only for one year, but... Damn. I mean, granted, they did lose Patrick Marlowe, which we'll talk about in a minute, so they do have some cap space, although now with the Vlasic and Jones, you know, signings, maybe not. I don't know, man. It's a weird situation for Sharks fans right now, and that franchise in general. The St. Louis Blues haven't really done anything. <laughs> you know, re-signing Pariarvi, re -sign or signing up Sunkvist, who, you know, you got in the Ryan Reeves trade. Bo Bennett, decent signing. Chris Thorburn, who, what the hell, Vegas... Like, what? Why? Why did you take... I mean, I know that there was a trade involving picks and everything, but, I mean, you just let Thorburn go. <laughs> I mean, that's basically Ryan Reeves' replacement in St. Louis, but, yeah, I mean, not too much to say about the Blues, clearly. The Tampa Bay Lightning, I won't sit here and fucking <laughs> praise Steve Eiserman, you know, for the next three hours like I could easily do. Bottom line, they're looking okay. They have their depth. You know, signing someone like Corey Conacher is a fine move. Uh, Sasunov, Sasunov is like, he's like fucking six foot eight, but he's a long way away. He's 19 years old. Jamie McBain's not a bad signing. The, the big moves are Girardi and Kunitz. And is Dan Girardi worth three million bucks over the next two seasons? 
I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. But we'll see. I have a really hard time criticizing Jim Rutherford in Pittsburgh and Steve Eiserman. I have a really tough time criticizing either of them. And obviously Pittsburgh have just won two cups in a row. Yes, they just gave up a first round pick for Ryan Reeves, but they're still in a pretty damn good spot. And with Tampa, you look at just the wizardry of Steve Eiserman to avoid having the expansion draft be this disaster. If he doesn't handle it properly, odds are, and I don't know for sure who had to have been protected or not, but odds are he would have lost somebody like a Palat, like a Johnson, like a Kucher, like somebody of that caliber very well could have been taken by Vegas if Eiserman didn't handle it the way he did. So, yeah, is the is the Girardi contract questionable? Sure. Kunitz, not as much. Two, you know, two million over one year. That's fine. The bottom line is they're the Tampa Bay Lightning. As long as they can stay healthy, and as long as Vasilevsky, you know, really rises to the occasion of actually being the starter for that team, they're cup contenders. Absolutely. And it's God, it, it it sucks to have them in the in the same division as your team. It really does. And again, I've stated this before. If you're not jealous that Steve Eiserman isn't your GM, unless you're Pittsburgh, or, you know, Chicago, given the success that they've had. Basically, there are very few franchises and very few fan bases that, you know, have the right to not be jealous <laughs> that Steve Eiserman isn't their GM. The Tampa Bay Lightning are going to be ridiculous. Toronto. Now, obviously the big signing here is Patrick Marlowe, but talking about what else, you know, other things that they've done. I mean, Ron Hainsey, good signing, good defenseman to add to the team. A little bit of a, let, you know, not as much risk in that signing as the Marlowe deal. And the Bruins losing Dominic Moore to Toronto. I'm not too surprised, and that's a good replacement for Brian Boyle. But with Patrick Marlowe, the, the risk is next year William Nylander's contract is up, if I'm not mistaken. And then the year after that, both Matthews and Marner. So you could have some cap issues down the road. I'm not saying that they're going to lose any of those three. They might have to lose somebody else, though, because of this Marlowe deal. You have him signed until he's 40 years old. I don't know, man. He's still a good player. And the fact is, Toronto could win the Cup. In that time frame, Toronto could win the Cup. No doubt in my mind. But, God, that deal. But here's the thing, right? If you win the Cup, who gives a shit? If you don't, that's when it's a problem. You look at the 2013 Bruins. Not only did they lose in the final, but the fact that they lost in general. When you had, you know, Yager, you had a Ginla, Johnny Boychuk, and having to trade Boychuk gutted the team. No different than Chicago losing Brandon Saad. I'm surprised the Bruins haven't tried to bring back Boychuk yet, a leader in that locker room. So with the Leafs, they're still in a really good spot. I mean, <laughs> very quickly now, they've gone from jokes to legitimate contenders. And again, it sucks to have them in your division. The Vancouver Canucks have been pretty damn interesting and honestly have made some pretty good signings. Now, are they going to be a playoff team next year? Who's to say, really? I mean, right now, your goaltending situation, you have Markstrom, you have Nilsson, and that's okay. But is that good enough to make it to the playoffs? Who's to say? On defense, they have a nice you know situation, especially after signing Weirkoch and Del Zotto, where you're going to have competition for those top six spots. And Sam Gagne is a pretty damn good signing. Burmistroff's a nice cheap signing as well. So Vancouver's looking all right. But I would classify them in that bracket of, I wouldn't bet on them making the playoffs. But I will say if they do, I won't be surprised. They still have some really you know, good pieces on that team. So it'll be interesting to find out the Vegas Golden Knights. Well, they're signing just about everybody, aren't they? I'll just say this about the Knights. Do I expect them to make the playoffs? No, absolutely not. Although there was that thought that maybe they could after, uh, you know, you know, after the uh, expansion draft, or really before the expansion draft is where you had those rumors of, you know, oh, they might be good enough to make the playoffs. Wouldn't bet on it. Washington, I mean, I still the TJ Oshie deal. Yikes, you re-sign Brett Connolly, and that's fine. Chandler Stevenson's not a bad player to re-sign. Dmitry Orloff, you almost lost to the KHL, apparently. $5.1 million contract over the next six years. Is he worth that? Probably, but that's a lot of money to commit. 
And then you factor in the Kuznetsov deal. 7.8 million for the next eight years. Is he worth that? I don't know. But I don't know how to explain the Washington situation. You had to trade Marcus Johansson because of some of these signings. All I know is that I've made it clear. I'm a fan of Alex Ovechkin. I don't really understand how you... I mean, even, even if you're a Penguins fan or something like that. I mean, still, you have to respect Ovechkin's ability. You don't necessarily have to be a fan of his... I mean, if, I'm just worried that he's going to be the next Joe Thornton. And legitimately, if Ovi goes on, it, it wouldn't be a matter of Ovi going onto the list of best players that never won the Cup. Ovi would be the list, and then you'd have some sort of secondary side article saying everybody else who isn't Alex Ovechkin that didn't win the Cup. No disrespect to guys like Marcel Dion. But I, I don't know what to make of the Washington Capitals. I really don't. You lost someone like Nate Schmidt. Justin Williams just like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Who knows? There's all these question marks around the team. Maybe next year is the year, as we will keep saying until they eventually lose Alex Ovechkin one way or another. And that brings me to the last team, the Winnipeg Jets. Cameron Schilling, not a bad signing. Steve Mason, I don't know, man. 4.1 million for two years. I'm just glad the Bruins didn't take that, li- didn't take that risk is all I'm saying. That's that's pretty crazy. Now, again, kind of like Pavlik, when Mason's on top of his game, pretty damn good goalie. When he's not, he's pretty shit. So good luck with that, Winnipeg. I'm sorry that you haven't had that stability. And who is the starter next year? Is it Mason? Is it Hellebuck? You would assume Hellebuck, but if you're paying Mason 4.1 million bucks, you would assume that Mason is the starter. So I don't know. The Kulikov deal is also... Pretty damn risky. I don't know, man. I have no idea what to make of the Jets, and they might just be on that list of not making the playoffs. Now, they were crippled by injuries last year, and you can't necessarily doubt a team that has the talent of Shifley, Line A, Bufflin, I mean, she, uh, Nikolai Ellers as well. But that goaltending, that goaltending still looks to be the big issue. Now, I will say here, I wanted to talk about these trades as well. The Marcus Johansson deal, I kind of mentioned for Washington, you had to do it to clear up cap space. It's a great deal for the Devils, and another reason as to why they could be back in the playoffs sooner rather than later. So for the Devils, that's a great deal. Marcus Kruger gets flipped to Vegas, and apparently they're going to flip him elsewhere. Carolina is the rumor right now, so that deal is what it is. And of course, Chicago frees up cap space, so good for them. Uh, Emelin to Nashville. Vegas retains a little bit of salary. The rumor was is that they wanted him so that they could use him to try and get Matt Duchesne. What the hell? Like, why? Like, hey, good for... I mean, here's the thing. For Vegas, would you rather have Charlie Houdon or that third-round pick? Who would you rather have? I guess we'll have to wait and see who that third-round pick turns out to be. But for Nashville, is Emblem necessarily a fit? Tough to say. I assume they'll get rid of him, though. But we'll see. Uh, from there, you got Christos Gudlivskis, the best name in hockey. No, he's not Yerky Yoki Pocket, never mind. But, you know, Na- no, Nashville. The Islanders get him. Nashville does trade Colin Wilson to Colorado, which is a good pickup for the Avs, and they can afford to eat that contract. And again, it'll be interesting to see just who makes the Preds forward lineups next year. A couple of uh, players that could definitely make the team, but we'll have to see what happens. Maybe the biggest trade of the bunch. I mean, aside from like Panarin. But Scandella and Pominville to Buffalo in exchange for Ennis and Felino. And Felino still hasn't been signed, as far as I am aware of. It's interesting. Cool to see Jason Pominville back in, you know, back in Buffalo. Scandella is a good defensive addition for them for the Minnesota Wild. You know, you took the risk on Hansel. He's gone, but you do get someone like Ennis, who I believe can still play center. I think Marcus Foligno can as well. We'll see if they actually resign him. It's a good deal for both teams. The Eddie Lack trade, I kind of already mentioned, and the fact that Calgary let Ryan Murphy go. We'll see. Again, for the Flames, if you're putting that much stock in Mike Smith and Eddie Lack, best of luck to you with that one. And then the Mark Mathot deal. Not too bad. Like I mentioned, Dallas still could potentially use that one extra defender, but Mathot will certainly help things out. And I'll be intrigued to see if he's on a pairing with John Klingberg. And, you know, Mathot kind of played that super defensive role to allow Eric Carlson to be a, to be Eric Carlson. 
this could be a big time breakout year for John Klingberg. I did want to mention though, really quickly, and actually here, let me uh, let me go back to that. I did want to mention the you know some of the guys that aren't yet signed. Markov, where's he going to go? Who the hell knows? You're probably not going to go back to Montreal for that money. Take a cheap deal. Jerome McGinley, take a cheap deal. Dennis Weidman, you're probably not going to get signed by anybody because every official hates you. Drew Stafford might come back to Boston. That's good, though. Yager, sign for dirt cheap. Please, go back to Pittsburgh or the Rangers or the Capitals. Sign for dirt cheap. Go to the Capitals. I want to see Yager play with Ovechkin. That's what I want. I want Ovechkin, Backstrom, Yager. They'll win a cup. Mark my words. UC Okanen's going to be a really good signing for whoever gets him. Shane Doan, I wonder if he's actually going to get a contract. Johnny Oduya, who knows? Simone Dupre, injury concerns. Mike Ribeiro, injury and personal issue concerns. So tough to say. Nail Yakupov, is he going to get a contract or is he going to have to go back to the KHL? If he goes to the K, I mean, he's, he's never going to ex- he's never going to escape that bust label and that bust label. And if he does. I don't know if we ever see him back in the NHL again. Tough to say, although I'm sure a part of him will always think to himself, I gotta go back to see what happens here. Uh, Thomas Vanek wouldn't be a bad signing. Jimmy Hayes. I avoided talking about this for most of the video. So officially, the Bruins have nobody remaining on the team. The trade tree is dead from the Tyler Sagan deal. Joe Morrow, you let him walk. He signed with Montreal. Oh, my God. I don't even want to talk about this. Louis Erickson, you didn't trade him. You missed the playoffs. You let him walk to Vancouver. Matt Frazier, you lost him on waivers to Edmonton. Oh, my God. I don't even want to talk about it, Jimmy. And then, of course, I mean, yeah, you ended up trading Riley Smith for Jimmy Hayes. Ugh. Damn it. And it really sucks, too, with him being, you know, a Massachusetts guy and everything. That it didn't work out for him. But, yeah. You want to talk about worst trades in NHL history? I mean, that was already up there. It's definitely up there now. But anyway, the point being, looking at the free agent list, there are still some, you know, really decent guys out there. You know, no game changes, but complimentary players. Yuri Hoodler had a pretty, you know, rough year last year, but you could still argue was a decent enough player. Same with John Mitchell, Teddy Purcell, Grigorenko, as I mentioned, left to the KHL, P.A. Parento. I'd love for the Bruins to get P.A. Parento. I think that would be a pretty damn good signing. The last bit of concern, of course, is with RFAs. Edmonton needs to sign Dreisaitl. Pasternak needs to be signed. Arvidsson, I actually didn't know was an RFA. Him and Johansson. Point being, I expect pretty much all these guys to stay on the team because nobody likes to use offer sheets, but I figured I would just mention it. Guys, holy shit, I am running out of steam and don't think I could talk any longer if I wanted to. So that will do it for this one. If I didn't talk about a certain buyout, a certain trade, a certain signing, or if something happens by the time I put this video up, let me know down in the comments below and I will gladly talk about it. But from you guys, I want to know, who's your team and how well do you think they've done so far this offseason? Where do you think someone like Yager is going to end up? What do you think of certain signings? Should Joe Thornton have signed for $8 million bucks? Will Toronto regret the Marlowe contract? What do you think of Arizona trading for Chad Johnson and then missing out on this? So many interesting things. There are stories to follow with every single team this offseason. Yes, it's going to be long. Yes, it sucks that we have to wait until October. But it's still going to be really interesting to see how this all pans out. And I cannot wait for next season. So guys, that will do it for this one. I hope you did enjoy. If you did, feel free to drop a like. It would be greatly appreciated. It helps support me and the channel. To make sure you never miss a video, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Join the notification squad. Follow me on Twitter at Tugi24. You can also follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Tugi24. I've had some people ask if I'm going to do YouTube gaming streaming instead. Maybe, like I might try it out, but I am pretty well, you know, already kind of comfortable on Twitch, but we'll see in the future. But anyways, guys, I know a lot of you, a lot of you wanted to, uh, you know, see this video from me. So there you go. It is done. I'm losing my voice again. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.